All right. Uh, so what I'd like to start by doing here is kind of recapping what we've been working on the last few days. Because we've established at least the outline of a process that we can use to factor and solve a polynomial. Um, but it's been kind of spread over a couple of days, and here I just want to kind of regroup some of these ideas into like one coherent procedure because we've been doing this kind of you know like telling a story and we've been like oh look at what we've noticed here maybe we should do this instead and we haven't really kind of gone and like restructured everything into one coherent process in one place which I think would be really helpful for you guys at this point um, so that's that's what I want to kind of do right now is to just go through this as if it was you know like from with what we know now um, how to do one of these kinds of problems okay so let's say we asked to factor and solve the polynomial Two x cubed plus nine x squared plus seven x minus six. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the rational roots theorem. and make a list of my possible rational solutions to this. So the rational roots theorem is, cons I need to care about two parts of this polynomial. I need to care about the constant term. What's the constant term in this case? Negative six. And then I care about the factors of that constant term. And when I say factors, really I just mean the positive factors. You don't need to include the negatives also because we'll pick them up later with the plus or minuses when we use the rational roots theorem. Um, so what are the positive factors of 6? 1, 2, 3, and 6. I think I heard at some points from everybody. Okay. The other thing I care about is the leading coefficient. What's the leading coefficient in this one? 2. And then I also have to care about the factors of 2 then. What are, yeah, just one and two, right? Okay. So if I write down then my possible rational solutions, I'm going to have plus or minus each of the factors of the constant term divided by each of the factors of the leading coefficient. So I can do 1 over 1, plus or minus 2 over 1, plus or minus 3 over 1. So I'm just taking each of the factors of the constant term and dividing it by the factor of the leading coefficient. And I have to do that for each factor of the leading coefficient. So I also need 1 over 2, 2 over 2, 3 over 2, and 6 over 2. Is everybody okay with how I've constructed this list? So again, the second part of my list there, still using the factors of 6, and this time we're dividing by 2. Yes? Yes, so there are some duplicate solutions on this list, so let's kind of go through and weed out any of the duplicates. And Nick has pointed out that 2 over 2 is already on my list, because I have 2 over 2 is just 1, and 1 is already on my list. 
So let's cross that out. So you see another duplicate. 6 over 2, right? That's also the same thing as 3, which is also already on my list. So let's cross that out. So if I want to clean this list up then a little bit, I just have 1, 2, oops, sorry, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 6, plus or minus a half, and plus or minus 3 over 2. So that's my list there. Do I have to show all of these work that I've done written down here on your papers? No. If you just write the list, I'm fine with that. I just, because these are notes, I wrote everything down as to what I'm doing and where the numbers are coming from. So if you're going back to look at this as an example, it would be helpful to you. But I'm fine with you just giving me the list and you don't have to give me like all of the factors and then all the factors of that one and then all the list and then cross out the duplicates and then rewrite it all nice. If you just give me the rewritten nice one, I'm fine with that. Is that okay? All right. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my calculator and look at the graph of this polynomial. So I'm going to fire up my graph and calculator. Do you guys need to turn the light on to be able to see the graph and calculator? If you do, just stand up and do it. It's no big deal. You don't have to ask. Just whoever's close or whatever. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to open my calculator, turn it on, and then press the Y equals button. And then I'm going to type in the polynomial that I'm trying to factor, or the polynomial I'm trying to solve, it doesn't really matter, into my calculator, into the y equals menu, exactly as it's written. So I'll give those of you following along a chance to do that right now. Um, but as you can see on the screen, I've already done that. So I typed in 2x cubed plus 9x squared plus 7x minus 6. Anybody still typing? Okay. Once I have my polynomial typed in, I'm going to press the window button. And when I'm selecting a window to view this, I'm concerned with two things. I need to change my x min and x max so that I'm able to see all of my possible rational solutions. And I have to make sure my y min and y max, I'm able to see the x-axis. Because what I'm looking for on the graph is just the x-intercepts, the place where the graph crosses the x-axis. So if I look at my list of possible rational solutions here, what's the smallest number on this list? Negative 6. Got to remember because these are all plus or minuses. Very good. What's the largest number on this list? Positive 6. So the x min and x max I'm going to pick is something a little bit less than negative 6 and a little bit larger than positive 6. So I chose negative 7 and negative or positive 7. Is everybody okay with how I chose my x's there? Now, if I graph and I get a lousy picture, because most of the space is empty, because maybe my biggest and smallest possible solutions were really small and really big, they're really far apart, I can always go back in and change the window to get like a more narrow view so I can get a better picture of what's going on. But I always want to start to where I can see everything. Now for the y min and y max, I just need to make sure the y min is a negative number and the y max is a positive number. It doesn't really matter what those two numbers are. 
I usually just use negative 10 and positive 10 and it's rare that I would need to change that for any reason. I just need to make sure I can see the x-axis. So if one of them is negative and the other is positive, I'll be able to see the x-axis and be able to see where the x-intercepts are. Okay, so my window is now set. So I'm gonna just go ahead and press the graph button. When I do that, make that a little bigger. I guess that's as big as I can make it. Um, I can read off my graph then where the x-intercepts are. So the origin here is zero. The first tick mark to the left is negative one. At the second tick mark to the left, it looks like the graph is passing through it. So that's an x-intercept at negative two. The next tick mark, it looks like the graph is passing through. That would be negative three. Now, if I go and I look at the positive side, again, I'm going to start at the origin, so that's a zero. The first tick mark to the right is one, and in between zero and one, I see that the graph is crossing. I might estimate that value where it's crossing as 0 0.5. It looks like it's halfway in between. Do you guys agree with that? Okay. So what I'm going to do where I've written graph is I'm just going to write down um, those x-intercepts that I observe by looking at the graph. Is everybody okay there? Good. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to compare what I've observed on the graph to my list of possible rational solutions. So I notice that, hey, I have negative 2 on my list, and I observe negative 2 on my graph. I have positive 3 in each of them. I'm sorry, negative 3 in each of them. And then I have positive a half. So it looks like each one of these is probably a rational zero, or rational solution, I should say. And each of them would be good candidates to use my synthetic division with. What, happened, what would it mean if I had an x-intercept that doesn't appear on my list? Not necessarily that something went wrong, although it could be that. But you can get x-intercepts that you observe on your graph that are not on your list. What that would mean is that those x-intercepts are irrational. So they're things like square roots of 2 or square root of 3 or something like this. We're not going to be able to do the synthetic division with those numbers. So you definitely don't want to use those. That's why before I start my synthetic division, I want to go back and compare what I observed on the graph to my list. And if it's not on the list, I don't want to use it for my synthetic division. Is everybody okay with that idea? Okay. So now I'm going to start the synthetic division to do my factoring. So I can pick, because each of these three were on my list, any three of, or any of them would be fine to start my synthetic division with. Personally, I would avoid the decimal because it makes the synthetic division a little bit messier. Um, so I would pick a whole number value to start with. And because I wrote it down first, I'm just going to start with negative 2. There's no good reason to pick that over negative 3. It's just what I'm going to do because I wrote it down first. So I'm going to write in the coefficients from the polynomial that we're trying to solve, or really... To solve it, we have to factor it. And then I'm going to proceed by doing the synthetic division process. Any questions on what I've done here? Okay, 
So this result allows me to partially factor that polynomial, right? So we had the polynomial 2x cubed plus 9x squared plus 7x minus 6. By doing the synthetic division and getting a remainder 0, I, I now have a partial factoring of this. Yes, Madison? Okay. So what is the partial factoring I get from this? Well, because I had a negative 2 give me a remainder 0, that tells me that one of my factors is x plus 2. This quotient was the constant term, the x coefficient, and the x squared coefficient. So it tells me the other part of my polynomial, or the other factor is 2x squared plus 5x minus 3. Is everybody okay with how I was able to take that synthetic division result and turn it into a partial factoring? Now we have two options here. This is partially factored. We still might be able to factor the 2x squared plus 5x minus 3 a little bit more. You have two options at this point. You can use or try to use the factoring tree or we can try to do another synthetic division. It doesn't really matter which one that we do. Notice here that we still have two values we haven't, synthetic, we haven't done the synthetic division with. So there's no reason that I can't do another synthetic division here. Right? So let's do that. Just to change up a little bit and show you another way of doing this. So I'll just pick another one of those values. This time maybe I'll use negative 3. So again, I get a remainder 0. That gives me another factoring. So the x plus 2 part is going to come down. The fact that negative 3 gives me a remainder 0 tells me another factor is x plus 3. And then I have a constant term and an x coefficient. So my other factor is 2x minus 1. So what happened here is this guy factored out into x plus 3 and 2x minus 1. That might have been a little bit easier than having to do the long factor since this was a quadratic whose leading coefficient isn't 1. So this is my factored form then. Is everybody okay with that? Olivia. This is pretty normal. Okay. Now I'm going slowly through this and I'm doing a lot of steps so that, again, first time we're putting this all together, I'm trying to really take my time and write everything out. But this is not uncommonly long. Okay. And certainly they could be much longer than this. So the bigger the degree of the polynomial is, the longer this problem becomes because you potentially have more synthetic divisions to do. Um, but that's really not the longest process. The place where I want to spend most of my time is figuring out what numbers to do the synthetic division with. Because if I don't do a good job there, the synthetic division goes really poorly afterwards. Right? I want to try to spend a lot of time in the beginning coming up with the good candidate so that when I sit down to do my synthetic division, things go on without a hitch. Does that make sense? So once you get better at like the process, things start speeding up. You get better at like, okay, I need to look at this and that's what this means, so I need to use this number. And things will speed up a little bit. But this is the first time doing it, so I'm trying to go intentionally quite slowly through it. And it's going to feel long and that's fine. That's, that's okay. 
And I'm, it's one of these where when I give you the homework for this that we're going to practice today, it's four problems. Because I understand that these do not go quickly right now. Okay? All right. So the last step then is to solve. And once we have this in a factored form, the solving is quite easy. Right? That's actually the easiest and fastest part of the whole thing. Because I can just take each of the factors, set them equal to zero separately, and solve. Yes, Lee? Isn't that just the numbers we had? Yes. It is the numbers that we found from the x-intercepts list. So why am I bothering to do all this extra stuff if I could just get the solutions from that list of x-intercepts? Well, there's two reasons. One is what happens if instead of that being one half, it was actually like, you know, the square root of two over three, which would have been really close as a decimal to one half, so close that you probably couldn't tell by just estimating on the graph what it was. So one reason is, though what we estimated from the graph might not be exactly that whole number. It might be something that's irrational that's just very close to one of those. The second reason is you're not going to be able to see the imaginary solutions by looking at the graph. So the imaginary solutions will always be hidden from us on the graph. The only way we'd be able to find imaginary solutions is by factoring it and then being able to set those factors equal to zero. So that's a good question. And for this one, it matched up exactly. And that'll happen sometimes. And then it will happen sometimes where you'll see things on the graph that you're like, oh, I thought that was like one and a half and it turned out it was the square root of two. And then there'll be times where it's like, oh, look, I found some solutions that I couldn't even see on the graph that would have been imaginary. So that's why we have this all this extra work built around rather than just, why don't we just look at the x-intercepts and write those down? And it's because, well, it's, like, it's possible you would not get all the answers, and then it's possible that like you might estimate something to be rational when it's really not. And you're going to see that in the, in the homework that I give you. So we'll see some of those cases kind of crop up. Does that feel okay now? So that's a good question. And it's certainly, that's the next step when we start tacking on some more things to this process to help us detect those situations. We're going to add some more theorems here in the next couple of days to be able to detect and deal with some of those situations. In addition, again, looking at the graph, if a solution is used more than one time, like if you get x equals 2 as an answer twice, not entirely that you could get that from the graph alone. You'd still need to do some factoring and solving to detect those sorts of situations. So that's three real reasons why we need to worry about the rest of that synthetic division parts. Okay.